Thank you all for coming today evening. <coughs> and I'll speak on the topic of tap the power of thoughts. Don't be trapped by the power of thoughts. So I'll start with a metaphor. That's charging now. Thank you. So I'll start with a metaphor. And I'll build on this metaphor using an acronym. And then we will have some discussion based on that. We are always full of thoughts. But we aren't always thoughtful. <laughs> we are always full of thoughts. Thinking is something which we do incessantly. We cannot stop thinking ever. Even the idea that I should stop thinking is itself a thought. So in that sense, we are always full of thoughts. However, our thoughts are often like a basement which is filled with a huge pile of books heaped haphazardly. On the other hand, when we are thoughtful, that is like a library in which there, is, there are lots of books, but they are all sorted systematically. So if we see a basement with huge pile of books, just thinking of sorting all those books, even to find one book which we need, that itself seems such a burden that we may feel exhausted by that. But when we see a library well sorted, that may inspire us, yes, I want to read. So both the disorderly basement and the orderly library are full. But one exhausts us, whereas the other energizes us. Similarly, when we are full of thoughts, at that time, our mind is so filled with this I thought, that thought, that, that, that. So many thoughts are running haywire inside it, that even without doing anything, we start feeling exhausted. Whereas when we are thoughtful, at that time, our mind resembles a library. And then we can analyze clearly and act effectively. So to move from being full of thoughts to being thoughtful, that is the journey of inner transformation and inner empowerment. To the extent we can do this, to that extent we will be empowered internally to deal with whatever external situations we may be facing. The Bhagavad Gita begins by depicting how Arjuna was full of thoughts and this thought, that thought, that thought, all those thoughts burdened him so much that he just quit. He became so overwhelmed that he could no longer fight. Even before the external confrontation began, internally he had been deflated and defeated. For all of us also, we will face situations when we face some problem externally, but our thoughts make the problem worse and we become incapable of facing it. Arjuna at the start of the Bhagavad Gita puts aside his bow saying, I can't fight. Arjuna's bow represents our determination, our confidence, our enthusiasm, see, our positive energy to do some constructive activity. And at the start of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna has put aside his bow, saying, I can't fight. But at the end of the Gita, he has picked up his bow, in readiness to do 
whatever he is called to do no matter how difficult it may be so the narrative of the bhagavad gita raises arjuna from being full of thoughts that were disempowering him to being thoughtful which led to him being empowered so how can this happen for us we all have hundreds of thoughts going on every minute within us some thoughts just come and go some thoughts get a lot of attention and some thoughts consume our attention so i'll talk about this journey from being full of thoughts to being th thoughtful in terms of an acronym that acronym is four e's education experimentation evaluation and elevation education originally if you look at the greek or uh, latin root of the word education it means educare it means to bring out that which is within we have an enormous amount of educational information available to us in today's world at the same time there seems to be a significant amount of inability to deal with our inner world martin luther king put this presciently almost half a century ago when he said we have guided missiles and misguided men through our technology we have learned to control externals very effectively but the internals remain uncontrolled in fact much of the internal remains unknown also so education refers to understanding what happens in our inner world in this context the education is like a light a flashlight which we flash inwards to understand what is going on and for understanding our inner world the bhagavad gita offers us a three level model of the self it explains that there is the body mind and soul and we are an integrated unit which has all these three dimensions physical psychological and spiritual we can understand this by comparing it with a computer system wherein there's a hardware software and user the hardware is like the body the software is the mind and the soul is the user even the best phone or the best computer with the latest hardware in it can't function if the software becomes corrupted and today we have by technological progress we have luxuries available to average middle class people such luxuries that were unimaginable even for royalty a few hundred years ago air conditioning air travel uh, mobile communication so externally at the level of the hardware we have had a significant amount of progress but at the level of the software at the level of the mind it's almost as if we have had a significant level of regress we have mental health problems increasing in alarming proportions 1 million people commit suicide every year which amounts to one suicide every 40 seconds which amounts to since we started this talk 15 people have already committed suicide this 1 million figure is more than the number of people who are killed in an average year in murders terrorist attacks and wars combined together so more than the number of people who are being killed by others 
are the number of people who are killing themselves. So this is the destructive power of the mind. Wherein suicide is the extreme example of the mind killing the body. Yes, there can be various causes for a person to take their life. At the same time, none of these causes are irresistible. There may be others in similar situations who may not become suicide. There can be external pushes, but it is internally when the mind gets affected negatively. That's when the mind destroys the body. So, even if there is not suicide, we can have other forms of mental health problems which do not destroy, but they drain and disempower. Depression and anxiety are two major mental health problems in today's world. And both of them involve a person losing heart and losing energy or losing the capacity to act effectively. Now, this corruption of the inner software is a serious problem. And to understand this three level model, it is not just education that is enough. In this model, if we consider the software and the hardware and the user as separate from the two, then the Bhagavad Gita explains that our thoughts, they are triggered by the mind. It is like on our computer, sometimes certain things open now as pop-ups. When they open as pop-ups, we may have nothing to do with them opening up. But when they open up, it's up to us whether we pay attention to them or we turn them, we close them. So in this context, I'd like to talk about the word thought itself in two different senses. We may say, I just got a thought. Or we may say, I have given this a lot of thought. Two very different meanings. I just got a thought means it's like an idea, it's like an event or a stimulus popping up in an inner world, in our inner world. I have given this a lot of thought means that I have analyzed it systematically. So combining these two meanings of the word thought, we can say not all our thoughts deserve our thought. Because there are so many thoughts which keep coming in. And if we start thinking about, we start giving our attention to everything that comes up, we will become drained. Going back to the computer example, if we are reading a news article. Now most news articles, almost all content on the net has clickbaits associated with it. Want you to click some other links and go to those other links. So if we are reading a particular article, at that time all the other links that are there, if we start clicking on each of those links, even if we click on one link and then we go there and something interesting opens up over there. But along with that interesting material, some other links are also going to open up. Or say if you are watching a video on YouTube, there is one video that is there, but then there is related content. And one after another after another, if somebody just keeps clicking on the links, they may spend hours and hours without learning anything constructive without doing anything worthwhile. So it's just because a link is there on the computer 
on the page which we are browsing does not mean that we have to focus on it. Now this is relatively easy to understand because the computer is external to us and we are looking at the computer and we know what we are doing. Okay, I am reading this article and the other content that is not my interest right now. But with respect to the mind, this becomes more difficult because the mind is inside us and although the mind is different from us because it is inside us we identify with it just as if you are reading an article and some other link appears or pop-up window appears because it's external we will evaluate it but when a thought comes up internally we tend not to evaluate it or to understand how our mind is different from us let's do a simple thought experiment so wherever you are you can sit comfortably and you can close your eyes now with your eyes closed you can take three deep breaths Now with your eyes closed, look at what you see in front of you. Obviously because your eyes are closed, you can't see what is physically in front of you. But still there is something like a screen inside you on which you may see this room or your home or your car or a loud one or you may see a series of images coming and going on that screen or you might just see a dull haze of colors whatever specifically that you see you see it on something like an inner screen as you are observing it try to take a step back and look at who is it that is observing it? I repeat, while looking at the inner screen, try to catch sight of the inner seer of that screen. Even if you try many times, try to step back and look at that inner seer. What happens is that the inner seer seems to step back with you. What you are looking for is what you are looking with. You are that inner seer. That is the soul. And the inner screen is your mind. You can take one deep breath and you can open your eyes. Thank you. So here, normally when our perception takes place, the three things, the inner seer, the inner screen and the outer scene, all three have to come in one line. Right now, you are looking at me, I am looking at you. If suddenly a thought pops up in our mind, hey, did I lock my house when I came out of my house? Oh, I don't know. Is a key there? Is somebody there at the house? Will somebody break in? One thought pops up and then immediately our thoughts start going in that direction. And then what I may be speaking, you may not hear it at all. So basically, physically you are here, but when the mind as a screen goes somewhere else, then we can't perceive things. Now, this inner screen, which is the mind, is meant normally to act like a window, wherein we see the outer world. But sometimes instead of acting like a transparent window, 
it can become like a TV. It can start showing its own images. So this is so the second. This is what we did just now. I talked about education, and what we did the thought experiment was the second part. That is the experimentation. And through this experimentation, we can understand the need for evaluation. Evaluation means that when this inner screen is it functioning the way we want it to function or is it functioning in some other way? If we function on the computer, we may be doing a particular activity, but sometimes say we are processing a video file. And then we find uh, we find the computers become very slow. Now that itself might be a memory intensive activity, but if it's become extremely slow, then we will look to see okay what all are the processes active in the background. Is there something which is taking up the RAM of the computer too much? So similarly for us, when we are functioning, our mind is the inner screen, but when going back to the starting metaphor of being full of thoughts versus thoughtful, a, li a basement versus a library, when we are full of thoughts, that time on this inner screen, various stimuli are just popping up, various links are there. What about this? What about that? What about that? What about that? And all these links, among all these links, what we want to do or what we are meant to do just becomes lost as one small stimulus. Normally when we are say reading anything on a computer or a phone, if we want to, if there is some link which is there, which is attractive, which seems interesting, then we need to click on it. And when we click on it, it will open. Suppose there were some technology, now with virtual reality coming in, it could be possible that such a technology may not be very far away. Suppose there was a technology which would notice where our eyes are looking. And just based on if our eyes go to a particular link, that link opens up. Then we would just be trapped. We are watching one video, we glance at another video and that video opens up. And then watching that one video, for a few moments our attention goes to another video, that also opens up. <laughs> it just go on and on and on. Uh, whether that kind of technology is developed digitally or not, internally at the level of psychology, that is how it works. On our screen, right now, say for all of you, your screen is acting like a window and you are hearing what I am saying. But at the same time, there may be other thoughts also going on. Some of you may feel this room is too cold. Some of you feel this room is too warm. Some of you may feel that you know, I have got so many things to do. When will this get over? <laughs> so all these are links which are there in the nearby. And I talked about the two meanings of the word thought. I got a thought and I have given this a lot of thought. So I got a thought is like the link has appeared over there. And I give it a lot of thought that means I focus on it and as soon as I give my attention to it, it opens up and once it opens up, it can just take all our attention and all our energy. So evaluation means that we need to understand and analyze whether a particular thought deserves our thought. Whether whatever thought is coming on within us, coming up within us, does it deserve our thought? Quite often, we take our thoughts too seriously. What do I mean by take our thoughts too seriously? That just because a thought has come inside our head, we think that we have to think about it. We think we have to give it our attention. But no, 
just as just because the link is there on a page which we are reading doesn't mean we have to open that link this capacity to evaluate our thoughts is increased when we understand the dynamics of our inner world the bhagavad gita with its philosophical understanding of the three level of the self it helps us understand that we are different from the mind and therefore we don't have to uncritically pay attention to whatever appears on our mind if you consider the mind to be like a screen if we understand that i am different from this then we can evaluate it so to explain this i'll give two three examples of what we mean by what i mean by evaluation i talked earlier about the two common mental health problems is that depression and anxiety in terms of this inner screen metaphor depression happens when our inner screen becomes like a tv and starts displaying or replaying all the bad things that have happened to us in the past so the inner screen goes to the past oh this went wrong oh this person did like this to me i made a mess of these things this 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 as we keep listing all the things that have gone wrong in our life as we keep dwelling on them we keep feeling more and more disheartened and when we start thinking this is what has always happened in my life and this is what is going to happen to me in future also we end up disheartened we end up depressed of course sometimes depression can be a clinical condition which may require medical attention but most often depression is more a psychological condition than a clinical condition conversely when ang- when people become overwhelmed by anxiety at that time the inner screen becomes like a tv showing all the things that may go wrong in the future we start seeing a horror movie this may go wrong oh i might get some terrible disease oh i might lose my job or oh, this might happen that might happen that might happen and as with these, all these things start playing inside us we start becoming panicky we start becoming paralyzed we start becoming we start hyperventilating we just become overwhelmed now it is possible that future may things may go wrong and we do need to prepare for the future and we also need to learn from the past in that sense the inner screen going to the past or going to the future is not the problem the problem is who is in control when we want to learn from the past it is we who are in control and we consciously direct our thoughts to the past okay this happened i did like this actually if i had done like this this could have been avoided when this person spoke like this if i had spoken like this matters could have been solved at that point or at least they would not have got aggravated so when we consciously are in charge and we take our thoughts backwards at that time we can go over the past and learn from it similarly when we are calm and in control and then we take our thoughts to the future then we can plan the future okay this happens i can do this if this happens i can do this if this happens i have to think what all i can do maybe i'll consult someone and that way we feel prepared so the mobility of the inner screen the versatility of the inner screen is just a fact of life it is neither good nor bad but it is when it takes control of us and it directs our whole consciousness that is when it becomes a problem just like if you are reading an article or you are watching a video and some other related video comes which is also interesting if we are if you want to learn about a particular subject 
and something else also comes up which is interesting, we can read it, we can read it or watch it, we will learn from it. But we have to be aware, this is what I, I, I plan to do, this is what I intend to do. So this capacity for evaluation is developed by our intelligence. This intelligence is not what is measured by our IQ scores. The, in, the intelligence that we measure by our IQ scores is basically our information processing ability, which is important in its own way. But here, the intelligence that we are talking about is the discerning ability, the ability to differentiate between our thoughts, to understand which are important and which are not that important. Another metaphor for another anal way of frame of analysis for understanding this evaluation. Say somebody has been surfing on the net and they have visited a particular site repeatedly, say Bollywood.com. So they have visited Bollywood.com many, many times and then they come to a spiritual program and then they hear about the Bhagavad Gita. And then they think, I want to know more about the Bhagavad Gita. They go on their browser and they begin to type Bhagavad Gita. And they type B. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens? Bollywood.com <laughs> Bollywood comes up. <laughs> now, they wanted to go to Bhagavad Gita. But because they have visited Bollywood.com many times, so now as soon as the starting trigger B comes up, the autocomplete will come up as Bollywood.com. Now when Bollywood.com comes up, they have to have that discerning. This is not what I want to visit. <coughs> Just because Bollywood.com has come up as autocomplete doesn't mean that they have to visit it at that time. So similarly for us in our mind, based on the kind of actions that we have done in the past, certain impressions get stored. There's a threefold process here. There's an action, that action becomes stored as an impression. And that impression comes up as a proposition. Action, impression, proposition. So, uh, to illustrate this, say this is the home, where this is a hostel or a residential place where two people are staying. And this is their workplace. And along the path, along the road, there is a bar. Now, one of them has never drunk and has no interest in drinking. The other has drunk many times and is almost like alcoholic. Now, when both of them pass by the bar, for the person who has never drunk, you may not even notice the bar being there. But for the person who has drunk repeatedly, what will happen? Let's automatically, yeah. The autocomplete will come. Let's drink. Let's drink. Just the side of the bar, let's go and take a drink. Oh, no, no, no. I've got a lot of work to do. No, actually, if you take a drink, you'll, you'll be able to work better. The way the mind can come up with his thoughts, we don't know. But here, why is that proposition coming in one person, not in the other person? That's because of the past actions. So our actions lead to impressions and the impressions lead to propositions. For all of us, what, depending on the different kind of actions that we may have performed in the past, certain impressions are stored. And when those impressions lead to certain propositions, that time we have to evaluate. Is this what I want to do? So just because a particular thought comes up within us. Earlier I said one meaning of the word thought is an event that happens inside us. I got a thought. So for, for us, based on the kind of impressions that have been stored within us, certain propositions will come very forcefully. Say if in the past we have been around authority figures who used to throw their weight around by yelling, by getting angry, by exploding. And we may have internalized that, that that is the way to get things done. 
and whenever anybody doesn't do things the way we want them to do we become angry and we start yelling and we start hurting people by way our inconsidered words i was at a place in australia where the i was doing some counseling over there and several people in that community told me that the community leader was very short tempered and it hurt and alienated so many people so when i talk with him and i explain this to him he the first thing he said is hey, if people would do what i tell them to do i wouldn't have to yell at them now in this case what has happened yes we all have responsibilities we do have to get things done but rather than taking responsibility for the anger what is he doing he is just not he is just saying that because this stimulus comes this response comes from me because they don't do what i'm telling them to do so i'm yelling at them now there might be other ways of persuading people of explaining the importance of uh, things to people yelling may not be the only response but the internal capacity to evaluate has gone off so much that we associate this stimulus with this response because they don't do what i am telling them to do i yell at them however that stimulus doesn't have to trigger this response sometimes you might just decide if somebody is not doing this work maybe they are not the best person to do this work maybe they can do some other work and we can delegate to someone else there are various other responses possible when a person is not doing the work just yelling may not be the solution it's rarely the solution actually so basically this is like the stimulus somebody not doing what we want them to do what we told them to do that stimulus is like the b coming on the browser window and the response yelling is like the autocomplete bollywood.com So now just because b has come that doesn't mean bollywood.com has to come from b bhagwadgita.com also can come but when we are unable to evaluate we we equate a particular stimulus with as we we assume that the particular stimulus is the justification for a particular response or rather the stimulus and response get tied together for us in fact free will is actually the distance between stimulus and response between stimulus and response execute exer, ex- exists our capacity for free will the greater the distance between the two the greater is the free will so for a non alcoholic the pass by the bar the see the bar the stimulus is there but there is no response so here now combining these three different metaphors of alcoholic of the stimulus response distance and the proposition <clears throat> what happens is that the more we indulge in a particular acti- activity or the more we habitually do a particular kind of behavior the stronger becomes the impression within us and that that impression comes as such a such a forceful proposition that we don't even notice that it's actually a proposition which we can choose or not choose we just act on it and when this happens when the the connect the distance between the stimulus and the response become so tiny as to be almost non existent that is when compulsion or addiction comes up now addiction is not just necessarily to substances like alcohol or drugs the word addiction has a clinical meaning but there may be people who are addicted to video games just play 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 somebody might have a compulsive reaction of anger as i said earlier so to the extent we can evaluate this is the stimulus but is this response necessary 
I might be prompted. This is the response that comes up as a natural pushing within me, as a natural proposition within me. But I don't have to choose that. How can we not choose that? That brings us to the last part of this four point discussion. I talked about education, experimentation, evaluation. And the last is elevation. Elevation means I talked about this inner seer, inner screen, and outer scene. Now, I talked about these in a horizontal sense, but we could envision them in a vertical. Our self could be like a three level building. There's a physical reality, mental reality, and spiritual reality. So, to the extent we understand that I am a spiritual being, that I am different from whatever is happening in the outer world and I am different from whatever is popping up in my inner world. I exist at a higher level of reality. To the extent we understand this, to that extent we can see these physical and mental events with perspective. What do I mean by this? <clears throat> Say, if there is a storm, if there is a flood uh, on the in a particular area, and if we are on the land, we'll be panicky. If along with the flood there is a storm, even if we are flying in a small plane like a helicopter, the helicopter might also experience turbulence. But if we are in a satellite way above the earth we will see the flood we will see the storm but we will not be affected because we are at a higher level we will be concerned about what is happening but we won't be disturbed by it because we won't feel personally immediately threatened so this elevation of our consciousness amidst the floods and the storms that may happen at the physical level or the mental level, this elevation to being in a satellite, that is the essence of spiritual growth. Spirituality is meant to help us raise our consciousness above our situations and above our emotions. Both are real, but we are not defined by these two things. We are different from, we exist at a level higher than these two. And to the extent we can rise to the spiritual level, to that extent we can observe our emotions, we can observe our situations and we can respond maturely to them. What is, how do we elevate our consciousness? In different traditions, there are different processes for this. The Kirtan that we did at the beginning of this talk, this is also a process for spiritual elevation. At one level, just by this musical Singing, we might feel peaceful, which is good. But it can offer us much more than peace. It can actually raise our consciousness upwards to the spiritual level. And once the consciousness is risen to the spiritual level, at that point, we become calm. We can evaluate and we can act appropriately. So I'll conclude with two metaphors. Okay, and one story. In cricket, when the match is going on, there is at the center of affairs the umpire. Now, in English, there are two words which are often used interchangeably, but they have different connotations. One is uninterested, and the other is disinterested. 
disinterested means one who has no vested interests one who is impartial uninterested means one who has no interest at all one who doesn't care for things at all so suppose the cricket match is going on and the players appeal how's that and they all turn to the umpire and the umpire says i was not watching the match <laughs> what were you doing then <laughs> You meant to watch the match. If you don't want to watch the match, don't be, don't want to watch the match. Then don't be an umpire. So the umpire can't be uninterested. The umpire has to be disinterested. Similarly, for us, when we understand that we are souls, then we see our position to be like the umpire. We are not the players in the team. We are neither in the fielding team nor in the batting team. but we are different from both and in a disinterested way we have to observe both and we have to evaluate so the the process of spiritual growth helps us become situated in that role of the umpire in the bhagavad gita krishna used this the word udasina vadasinam be situated as if detached so when we become a detached observer of our emotions and our situations then the some emotion may say just hit back at you that person is done like this put them in their place just hit back at them other other person may say just neglect it just overlook it some other voice may say you know maybe i need to do something for this maybe i need to register a complaint with someone or maybe confront that person and talk with them in a proper way So all these voices are coming in. If we just understand that we are meant to be the umpire, we are not the player over here. <coughs> Then we can evaluate because we are not one of the players. We are the observer of the play. We are the umpire of the play. The umpire also has a lot of power. The umpire's decisions determine the direction of the play. so situating ourselves in the role of the umpire doesn't mean that we become passive it just means we become situated in a way that is for our best interests that is for our higher purpose the second metaphor for this for this understanding this idea of elevation is that when we are not caught in the heat of things at that time we can perceive perceive things more clearly so just as many times when we look back at events i say only if i had not done that only if i had not spoken like that only if i had checked myself at that time there is a saying that words spoken in haste are regretted at leisure so we just get angry and we feel oh, i want to give this person a piece of my mind actually what happens is by that when we give others a piece of our mind we end up losing our peace of mind at that time we may feel some relief but afterwards we lose by giving others a piece of our mind we we'll end up losing our own peace of mind so at that time just as time at that moment we felt like doing something but time creates a distance and the distance gives us some perspective so similarly in internally if we could elevate ourselves just as time creates a distance we can create a distance between our emotions by our spiritual practices so whatever so the spiritual practices are not just some cultural practices or some religious practices they can be done in that mode but they can serve a far greater purpose when we practice meditation when we study wisdom texts like the bhagavad gita when we internalize their message then that internalization raises our consciousness and with that raised consciousness we can act appropriately because we get a distance so a few, in the last several years i have been coming to america from india 
and I go to various universities, companies, give talks. For the first time when I came, I went to university and I gave a talk on regulating our mental diet. And after that, one American boy came and talked with me. And he said, just before this talk, I was contemplating suicide. He said, he had been in a relationship with a girl and she had broken up with him. So he said, I was wandering gloomily in the campus. He had seen a poster of the program. And he, something within him said, let's go for that program. Now he said, now after I come for the program, he said, I have understood that it is not I who want to commit suicide. It is my mind which is prompting me. Commit suicide, commit suicide. So, I told him, I have spoken many times that spiritual knowledge can be life-saving. But in your case, it has been literally life-saving. <laughs> so, I told him, uh, this is a precious insight that you have got. You need to cherish it. I encouraged him to read the Bhagavad Gita. There's a local Bhakti Yoga club that went on in the college. I encouraged him to connect with that. I also write on the Bhagavad Gita daily on a website called gitadaily.com a 300 word small meditation, the practical application of the Gita. So I encourage him to visit that. He subscribed for it. And then every year, uh, once or twice, whenever I come to America and go to that university, I would go and he would come for the program and we would talk. So last year when he had come, when uh, he came for a program, he told me that he had been in a similar situation. He had again been in a steady relationship, but somehow uh, it, the girl had broken up with him and she had sent him a, texted him a message and she said that, I don't want to talk with you, I'm going to block you, don't try to contact me. So he is just in a daze, he came to his room, he closed the door, closed the windows, pulled down the drapes, turned off the lights and as he had been practicing bhakti yoga, he had liked music from the beginning. So he used to play a violin. So he picked up a violin and he started singing Hare Krishna. And he told me he sang continuously for six hours. Just this, the complete darkness inter externally, there's no distraction at all. He so lost himself in the singing. And he said, as I lost myself in the singing, I found myself. You know, actually, he said that what could have been? I felt as if I was being bathed in a sublime light. I felt I was being embraced by a divine presence. He felt as if in losing himself, he was finding something about himself which was deeply secure, which was indestructible. He says, what would have been a depressing experience became one of the most enriching experiences of his life. And he, by that, recovered from that whole situation. Not only recovered, but actually became stronger. Because all that he had talked about, the spiritual aside, he experienced the capacity of it to give strength, to give solace. So in this case, what happened to him? If you go back to the example of the software, so when he got that message, the prompting came. Okay, this is terrible. Commit suicide. So he went into the room. He locked everything up. Uh, he locked the door up. But another prompting also came up. He, because he had practiced spirituality, because he had sung, he had chanted, he had practiced bhakti yoga. So a spiritual prompting also came up. Chant instead. And when this prompting came up, fortunately for him, he listened to that. And when he listened to that, that paved the way to light for him amid the darkness. Similarly for us, at present, there may be different impressions within us. And at one level, those impressions will give, keep giving us certain propositions. But if we learn to evaluate, then we can say no to those propositions. And instead, we can create healthier habits for ourselves. One healthy habit is just the habit of incorporating a regular spiritual practice in our daily routines. Studying the 
Gita, practicing mantra meditation. Such practices will also create impressions within us. And when these impressions become strong by regular practice, then whenever any thing, any unwanted stimuli comes in the environment and that unwanted stimuli gives a proposition, there will be an alternative proposition available for us, a healthier proposition. And with that healthier proposition available, we can say no to the unhealthy proposition. In general, saying no to anyone is not easy. If somebody invites us for a program, say today evening, please come for this program. Now you may say, we may not want to go, but at that moment, we may not think of some reason why I can't go. And we may even reluctantly go for that program. But if we already have some other engagement, you can say, you know, actually, my schedule is not open right now. Maybe in future I can come. I have to go somewhere else. So similarly for us, if we try to say no to those propositions that come up within us, it will be very difficult. But if we focus on saying yes to a healthier proposition, then that no will become much easier. And that healthier alternative is what opened by our spiritual is what is opened by our spiritual practice. The more we practice spirituality, the more we start understanding the dynamics of the inner world. Not only understand the dynamics, but we create positive impressions within us which lead to positive propositions. And then saying no to the negative propositions becomes easier. As long as we keep saying no to the negative propositions, we stay trapped by the power of the mind. But once we start getting positive propositions, once we start creating positive impressions by positive actions right now, then we start tapping the power of the mind. And then the mind works as our friend in fulfilling our life's important purposes. And then our inner world will become our aid in facing our outer problems, will not become an obstacle. And thus from being full of thoughts, we can become thoughtful. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on the topic of tap the power of the mind, don't be trapped by the power of the mind. I talk, started by, we're always full of thoughts, but we aren't always thoughtful. So our consciousness is often like a basement filled with books heaped haphazardly and just seeing it and thinking where to find a particular book that may drain us. So that's like being full of thoughts. That's how Arjuna was at the beginning of the Gita and he became disheartened, incapable of fighting. Being thoughtful means our consciousness like a library with all the books sorted systematically. Seeing it stimulates us. Yes, I want to read this book. I'll go here and find it. So for us, we want to make our inner world to be thoughtful. And for that, the journey from being full of thoughts to being thoughtful. I talked about four E's. What are the first? Education. Education. Thank you. So I talked about how we have so much knowledge about the outer world, but, but while there is progress externally, there seems to be regress internally because so many people are having mental health problems. And that happens, so that education about the inner world is provided by wisdom texts like the Bhagavad Gita. It offers a three level vision of the self, uh, body, mind and soul, which is like the hardware, software and user. And just as the software may give some autocompletes, which we have to choose whether to accept or not. Similarly, the mind gives us certain propositions. So thought can refer to an event inside our inner world. I got a thought and thought can also refer to our systematically giving attention to something. I have given this a lot of thought. So not all our thoughts deserve our thought. So this education with the experimentation was, we saw how the inner screen and the inner seer are different. We can see the inner screen, but not the inner seer because we, the soul are the inner seer and the inner screen is our mind. And this inner screen can sometimes just go off into the past or into the future. When it starts showing a tragic movie, tragedy movie of all the bad things that have happened in the past, we will end with depression. When it starts showing a horror movie of all the things that may go wrong in future, we end up with anxiety. So that brings us to the E was evaluation. 
So with our intelligence, whenever any thought comes up, we can evaluate. Is this inner screen acting like a window showing me what is ahead? Or if it is acting like a TV, is it acting with me in control? With, uh, you can go to the past and learn from the past. But when we are in control of our thoughts, we can go to the future and learn from the future, uh, prepare for the future. But again, when we are in control. So for this evaluation, discussed various metaphors. One was of the autocomplete in a browser. B will be coming as Bollywood even when we want Bhagavad Gita. And these autocompletes come because of past actions, past choices for us. So like alcoholic and non-alcoholic. The stimulus, when a particular stimulus comes up, a particular response appears within us. But we can say no to that response when it comes up internally. So the distance between stimulus and response is where our free will acts. And by recognizing, that's because somebody is somebody is being uh, uh, not doing what I'm telling them to do. Doesn't mean I have to yell at them. So we recognize that that might be my default response, but that doesn't have to be the only response that I choose. So the more we can identify the patterns in which the mind acts, then we can evaluate its propositions and choose whether we want to accept them or not. And to be able to evaluate those propositions, we need, last point was elevation. So if our thoughts are like, like a flood coming on the ground or like a storm coming in the air, and if we are either on the ground or in the air, we will be swept away. But when we are in a spacecraft high above, then the storm of waves or the flood of the storm or flood of thoughts won't sweep us, sweep us away. So our spiritual practice helps us understand that we exist above our situations and above our emotions. So we can be like an umpire in a cricket game where we are meant to be disinterested, not uninterested. We are not the players, but whatever the players are appealing. <coughs> and for this, when we practice spirituality, our consciousness rises upwards. And that spiritual practice creates healthy impressions, which gives healthy propositions. And I concluded by talking about the story of the boy who was suicidal, but by hearing the Bhagavad Gita, he identified so he evaluated. This is not I speaking, this is my mind speaking. And eventually, he elevated himself. So that, although he had faced a similar situation, but by experiencing spirituality, instead of getting depressed and suicidal, he became spiritual. So what was an enriching, what was a depressing experience, became an enriching experience. So when we internalize our own spiritual practices and create healthy impressions, then rather than trying to evaluate and say no to the unwanted unwanted uh, propositions, we evaluate and instead of saying no to the unwanted propositions, we focus on saying yes to the positive propositions and thus we move forward constructively in our life. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Thank you. Any specific part you found informative? I think the explaining, that's the really beautiful, ease. especially with the four E's. Okay. I think that's... Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Very yeah. scientific. Oh, thank you. Prabhuji, do yeah. we have any similar speech online or on the same topic that I wish I could have recorded this Okay. <laughs> it's, it's too late. Yeah. Oh, you have it recorded? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I have also recorded it, so it will come on my Facebook page also later. Also so, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, just one minute. Yeah. Yes, please. Can you help elaborate a little bit more about the state of depression that you can separate into the categories of psychological versus clinical? So that is something that for someone who is much younger, 
Mm. How to communicate to that person to say, this is the this is the psychological state and this is the clinical state. So because okay. in, in psychic war we always tend to convert <coughs> towards oh, it's all clinical. Yeah. And because we live in an environment where it's easy to put a blame on clinical aspects of things as opposed to mm -hmm. psychological spiritual. Is there something you can help understand a little better so that someone is depressed? How do you explain to them this is not a true clinical? They should also look at perhaps it's psychological. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, clinical and psychological are exactly the same. So That's true. Mm -hmm. So, how do we differentiate between, say, clinical depression that needs medical attention and psychological at, at, at depression? which may need to be simply behaviorally corrected. That also requires a psychologist. Yeah, that also requires a psychologist. Yes. If there is a clearly documented chemical imbalance in the brain or there is some structural damage to the brain because of which normal functioning is not possible, then it definitely needs medical attention. But in general, the, the world of mental health care, although there is a huge effort to treat it medically, it is actually very, very vague. There's no, I'm not intending to disrespect psychologists or especially psychiatrists over here. Because psychologists often do therapy through words. Psychiatrists also give medicines. But the fact is, psychiatry is not as scientifically soundly based as are other forms of patho other forms of medication. If somebody has got malaria or tuberculosis, we can actually tangibly identify the pathogens. These are the germs that have caused this. If somebody has got depression, there is no germ causing it. So <coughs> there are uh, there are psychiatrists themselves and. Uh, science authors who have written books expressing concern that we are pathologizing normal human behavior and we cannot find chemical solutions to human problems. There is a proposition now that uh, proposal that grief should be treated as a pathological condition that needs to be treated medically. Now, if somebody has a loss in their life they lose a child, a parent, a spouse, a sibling. Now that is going to lead to the person being disheartened. That is person going to be uh, not being normal for some time. And that's just natural. Uh, there are three psychiatrists say that if it's if for fifteen if after fifteen days a person doesn't recover from grief, then they need to be treated. Now, who decided 15 days and on what basis? There's a book called Crackler, Why Psychiatry is Doing More Harm Than Good, uh, by, written by a science journalist. And he gives a comparative graph over there of, say, people who have depression. And broadly, there are four ways in which they can be treated. One is through medication. The second is through Psychothera psychotherapy, talk therapy. The third is through placebos. They are not given medicines, but they are given sugar pills, but they are told as if they are given medicines. And the fourth is time. And actually, if you see, the difference between the four is negligible. That means, if 21% of people, uh, the, the, the healing percentage is 21% with medication, it's like 19 or, 19 or 20% with psychotherapy. It's 18% with placebo. And it's 17 or 16% with time. So, in general, the temptation in today's world is to externalize our problems and seek some external solution to the problems. So, if I consider my depression to pathological, then I can just say, I just have to find the right medicine. And this medicine is not working. But, Overall, the best way in a behavioral sense to deal with depression is to do something for someone else. 
That means, what happens when we are depressed, we start thinking, you know, I have this problem, this went wrong in my life, that went wrong in my life, that went wrong in my life. And in depression, the self, or rather self-obsession, becomes like a black hole that, that just consumes the consciousness of the person. So there have been some experiments done, or not ex exact case studies done, where depressed people were taken to disaster hit areas, say droughts or floods, and as they actually simple things like just taking some food package to someone and giving it to them, yeah. and when they saw that actually I can make a difference in someone's life. When people get out of themselves and start doing something for someone else, then that helps a lot. One of my friends in Canada is a psychotherapist and he said for many years I was doing individual psychotherapy, now I have started a group psychotherapy. So I told him that why would anyone, it's, it's difficult enough to tell our all our problems to one person. But why would somebody tell it to a group of people? He said that, no, we have codes of confidentiality. And because everybody tells their problems, nobody wants to be exposed, so people don't reveal. But see, the advantage is that when people start hearing everyone else's problems, they start realizing, my problems are not that big. Actually, few things make us as unhappy as our belief that we alone are unhappy. <laughs> we think, oh, I am suffering and everyone else is enjoying. But when we start hearing, we start to come, others also have so many problems. This, then we start understanding, oh, my problems are not that big. So basically at a behavior, this is where relationships come in very important. To the extent we are isolated, to the extent our relationships are very superficial, utilitarian, just transactional, I do this, you do this. To that extent, when the mind starts speaking something to us, this is like this, this is like this, like this. We, we don't have any alternative to the mind's voice. The mind is like a voice inside our head, it's speaking. This is wrong, that is wrong, that is wrong, that is wrong. <laughs> When we have close relationships, when we have committed relationships, especially if we, have a, if we have a spiritual relationship with a mentor or somebody whom we can trust, then the mind is speaking something. Most of the times, we evaluate everyone through the mind. That means, if somebody starts speaking very nicely to us, then immediately our mind says, what does this person want from me? Why are they speaking so nicely to me? They're going to flatter me and then they're going to exploit me afterwards. It may be like that, but it may not be like that also. So normally, we evaluate everyone through our mind. But if there is someone whom we can trust, whom we have well connected with, then the mind is here, we are here, they are here. When they speak, we learn to evaluate the mind through them. This is what my mind is saying, but this is what this person is saying. Maybe what my mind is saying is not necessarily right. So, in general, it is best not to assume that the depression requires clinical attention. Because another problem with that is, not only that, uh, it, it may not treat in a significant way, but it creates dependence. Then somebody may need to be lifelong on that medication. And many of these medicines often have other side effects. So, it's best if a person can be encouraged to come out of themselves. Now, how they can come out, that has to be, that has to be intelligently found out. So basically, if this is the circle of interest of the person, then if we can find out something within the circle of interest, which will stimulate them. So if, then in this case of this boy, he liked music. That was a liking which he had even before he became spiritual. And at that time when he was depressed, if he had tried to read the Bhagavad Gita or try to understand some philosophy, that might not have worked for him. But because music was already in the circle of interest 
and in the circle of spirituality also there is a part of music so where the intersection of the two lay that is where he could connect so if you can find out for somebody who is depressed spirituality is not just about meditation it's an entire culture in which art music dance drama uh, art, art, decoration so many things can be incorporated so if somehow we find out that circle within the circle of their interest and the circle of spiritual healing where that can intersect and they may feel stimulated to start doing that that will help them to come out of the depression okay thank you yes you had a question no i just wanted to say that at the end you talked about how we make decisions that instead of saying no to something we should say yes to something that's better yeah that's what i really really i think that that's something i personally struggle with making decisions so i'll, I'll start and i'll apply that to my own life oh, thank you yeah actually saying yes <laughs> is vital in the respect of the thought world we just can't say no why because if i decide if i am speaking in this class and i touch this mic and i find there is some electric current going in this now i may decide i'm not going to touch this mic because it will give me a shock so we can do that at a physical level i'll decide i'll not touch something but at the mental level we can't decide not to think of something because if i decide i'm not going to think of this i've already thought of it <laughs> so psychologists talk about uh, something say like the pink monkey experiment that is for the next 30 seconds please don't think of a pink monkey you can think of whatever you want but just don't think of a pink monkey and your 30 years of life you may never ever thought of a pink monkey <laughs> but in those 30 seconds oh pink monkey how does it look i never thought <laughs> so as soon as we decide i won't think of something thought is a subtle energy and it's like that subtle energy has already reached that object when we saying no so we have to have something positive in our life and to the, it is that positive which will help to replace the negative thoughts can't be driven out even when they are unwanted but thoughts can be crowded out so if we catch a thought get out it won't work but if we fill our consciousness with some more positive thoughts then that unwanted thought will get crowded out Thank you. You had a yeah. On the proposition part, like does every proposition have to be validated, or we can ignore some propositions? Like okay, yeah. So, do all propositions need to be evaluated, or can something be ignored? And ignoring is also an evaluation, isn't it? Yeah. It is. It means we just understand that okay, this doesn't need my attention. So actually all the time we are doing that. So right now when you are hearing this talk there might be say some other background noise. I am speaking right now my computer is fans may be making a noise. I am aware of that noise but I don't pay attention to it. Right now maybe some of us may be having a little back pain. We're sitting for a long time our legs may be needing us to be stretched. So we notice that sensation but we don't pay attention to it. so when some sensation or some stimulus is just mild and it is not disturbing us so much then ignoring it is relatively easy again we are it's easy because we are focusing on something else so ignoring is also requiring an evaluation but it is a evaluation that does not require much constant thought much conscious thought okay this is not important put it aside but sometimes some stimuli come in very forcefully it's just like if you've been sitting for a long time and our leg maybe our leg starts we need a stretch so sometimes the pain is it's mild it's bearable sometimes it becomes very unbearable then you might just have to get up or you might have to stretch something so it depends on the strength of the stimulus the stronger the impression the more forceful with the proposition when the proposition is mild you can just ignore it very easily and that is also based on a implicit evaluation you could say but when it is a very strong proposition at that time the evaluation needs to be done more consciously is that answer your question yes, okay now 
Anyone else? Anybody? Yes, please. Um, one question. <coughs> lastly, about what you spoke, different levels. Uh, uh, first level, the turbulences were maybe there, and my our mind should go to the top level. So you gave a, uh, some kind of a analogy as well, and also uh, to the point where the mind should be focusing on something to elevate ourselves. So my question is, don't it need some kind of a realization to get elevated? Even though scripturally we can get to that, oh, we need to elevate ourselves, we do ourselves now, if we, do, we are spiritual or whatever. But it's not like an automatic switch button that we should, we will be elevating ourselves. It's like realizations, right? Okay, yeah. So is elevation something which uh, we do ourselves or does it require some realizations to come from some higher source by which we will get elevated? It works both ways. We have to put in our endeavor and by our endeavor also we can raise our consciousness. Now of course we could put it in two ways. One is that when we want to rise up we could take a staircase and we climb up step by step by step up. But there's an elevator. We get into the elevator and there is a whole mechanism of power which we just activate by pressing a button. And then that elevator takes us up. So there are moments in our spiritual journey when we will feel ourselves being elevated by a power beyond ours. And suddenly some insight will just come in, some epiphany will come in and things will become clear and this is, this is not the way I want to be. This is not what I want to be. This is how I want to be. So at that time, in those moments of inner clarity, we feel ourselves lifted without even much effort on our part. So that means that would, we could say that happens by a higher, higher power. And we do want that higher grace. But we can't depend only on that grace. It's like if we want to get to the top of a building, if the elevator is working, we take the elevator. If the elevator stops working, it's not working, then we take our steps and keep moving onwards. So our daily spiritual practice is like taking the steps up. And that there are moments when just lucidity comes within those are like the moments when the elevator is taking us up. So we have to keep moving up, whether it is by the steps or by the elevator. And whereas the steps and the elevator are two distinct things, in, in a normal stair staircase and elevator are two different things. We could say in our spiritual journey, both are, both are integrated. So we take a few steps and then we find we are pulled up quite a bit more. So um, another metaphor which we could use for this is if somebody has fallen at the bottom of a well and then somebody from above offers a rope. They hold on to the rope and one way is that we not only hold on to the rope but we climb up ourselves using the rope. The other is somebody else lifts us out of the rope. Either way we want to get out. So if we are being lifted up, we will come out much faster. But if you are not being lifted up, we have to keep climbing. And it could be that we are also climbing up and somebody is lifting us up also. So in our case, it is that we by our are holding on to the rope, that is by committing to our spiritual practice, by that we indicate that we want to be elevated, we want to be lifted out of the well. And then, we are the finite consciousness, there is the infinite consciousness. So the infinite, by the infinite grace, also lifts us up. But we can't say that because I am not being lifted up, so I am going to stay where I am. We have to do our part. And by doing our part, we will make incremental progress. But there will be times when there will be like quantum progress also. So we long for that, but we don't, we don't bank on that alone. It said that if we wait for inspiration, then we are not seekers, 
we are waiters we have to be seekers if inspiration comes that's wonderful if it doesn't come we still keep moving on in general the difference between inspiration and dedication in inspiration the emotion precedes the action whereas in dedication the action precedes the emotion when we have inspired just feel like doing it i want to do this there are moments when we feel inspired you know i want to do this i want to do this i want to do this and our emotion helps us at that time so the emotion precedes the action we feel like doing it we feel driven to do it but there are times when inspiration may desert us so at that time we need dedication that means even if the emotion is not there the action precedes the emotion there's a nobel one of my main services is writing so i have read about other writers so there's a nobel laureate writer he was asked do you write every day or do you write only when you are inspired so he said i write only when i'm inspired and i make sure that i'm inspired every morning at 10 o'clock <laughs> that means there has to be a certain level of commitment a certain level of dedication is the answer question okay yes please so when you were saying that um, certain past actions create an impression because of which we get certain propositions right mm. so there is a stimulus and there is a response mm. and we have usually associated those response from uh, when we are growing up in our childhood some stimulus we see mm. when we see that as a response in a certain way and that has created an impression on us and that's yeah. usually the way um, a normal adult i would say mm. would respond because that's the group, the pattern that they have you know internal yeah uh, so uh, now when we come to a point that we want to actually evaluate and actually go to a position of elevating ourselves to see from a spiritual perspective and we want that response to be really different but since um, take for example for myself in the nerd i don't know a different kind of response how would i actually get a different kind of response for a, for the sim- stimulus that i'm always responding in certain way i want to change that response mm. like because i'm not being exposed to it. i don't have any other impression yeah of how to deal with that stimulus so if we have a particular way of responding and that we have imbibed from say during our childhood by seeing others if you want to change it also we don't have any knowledge of any alternative response so what do we do at that time yeah it's a challenge that's why we need say people who are who are more spiritually minded than us their association their example we see hey, you know this person this, this person is so provoked but still that person is responding so calmly it's not getting angry so it's possible to be calm in such situations also now our mind may dismiss and say because this person is so spiritually advanced that's why they can do it i can't do it that's okay but the point is we need uh people whom we can observe and get inspiration from and they can provide for us Uh, exa- my example or model of how there can be a healthier response and that's one thing so association is important and that's why if we associate with spiritually minded people that helps us to get the inspiration as well as the direction of where we can change along with that self observation also helps that means that if we understand that this kind of response is not not working for me it's working against me then we as conscious beings have the capacity for imagination we can use the word imagination in a negative sense just fantasizing but imagination can also be used in a positive sense like a creative visualization now this is not what i want to be this is how i want to be this is what i i want to become like so if we can visualize this visualization also requires some external model but even by our own self understanding we can observe and can, this is not what i want to become like maybe i i can visualize myself being a different person the journey to that may be a long journey but i can progress in that direction 
at least i can visualize in that direction and generally the uh, if we have even one person other than us who believes in us that is extremely helpful if we consider say cricket a sports almost all cricket players who become champions but they have had some mentors who believed in their potential and that inspired them to persevere so we need someone outside of us who has faith in us and in whom we have enough faith to confide okay this is what i planned to do but i ended up acting like that so when we have somebody like that the mind is offering us some narrative this is how you are and this is how you are going to be but somebody who t- tells us that you can become a different person you can function a more healthily and then we act accordingly but when if you are not able to act also we just tell it to them and we're telling it to them then they encourage us oh you could do like this it's look like this and that way we, we we can create a new path for ourselves if we don't have a if we don't have at present any friend or anyone like that then even verbalizing our thoughts helps writing our thoughts in a journal that helps us to distance ourselves from our thoughts so if there are certain situations where we tend to sabotage ourselves we act in a way that works against our best interests then we after that incident gets over instead of just beating ourselves up why did i do that we can write it down okay in this situation this is how i acted and just by writing things down as long as thoughts are inside our head they just congest us but when the thoughts get expressed in words and they get written outside that creates a distance that creates some relief internally and then we can evaluate and once we evaluate okay this is what i'm feeling like but maybe i can do like this also so i i because i travel a lot i correspond with people by emails quite a bit or by messages so there are times when people just do certain things which enrage me since my childhood i had anger issues so to some extent they have come under control but still the anger does come up at times so when i get angry with someone i made it a pol- i made a policy just not as when i get angry i write, write down hope if the anger is especially strong i write down all my anger in a mail but for 24 hours i won't press the send button and i find that in those 24 hours sometimes the other person gives some write something and clarify then i was thinking something entirely different or even they understand and they apologize or even if that doesn't happen in 24 hours when i look back at it again see and this i'm being too judgmental here or this okay this is a reasonable point but i don't have to verb verbal phrase it so harshly so when i just change that edit it soften it nuance it then i find that it helps in resolving the issue now if i don't write that email that anger will burn inside me but if i write and send that email that anger will cause burning somewhere else <laughs> but in between if we keep so generalizing this principle what we can say is that we generally think of <coughs> our emotions as being dealt in two broad ways one is expressing or repressing that means when a stimulus has come up either i resist the stimulus and suppress it or i just give into the stimulus and respond whatever way I, i am conditioned to but apart from expressing and repressing a third option can be processing and we can find out what is the way the best way for us to process so as i said talking with someone having someone to talk with that can help us to process and during that processing also a new path may emerge because when we are doing the processing at that time as we analyze the possibilities this 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 at that time a pattern emerges a path emerges this is how i can act so just because we have a particular way of functioning that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the way we have to function and even if we have somebody who is a model for us still their situation is different 
So in our life, we have to find our way to act in our situations. So that's why having a means to process our emotions, either by talking with someone or just getting them out in a written form and then evaluating that, that can help us to find our way ahead. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So yes, how much time do we have? We have all night. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we won't go that long for sure. <laughs> but yes, maybe one one or two questions. Yes, please. Yes. Um, regarding the depression, uh, you stated a point uh, where service of giving will is the answer for the depression, where the depression levels will come down. So that's a very good uh, uh, part where when we give something, definitely we feed ourselves that we have done something and we feel good about it and the depression levels will go down. Right? So at the same time, we are, are we not feeding the ego as well? And will it... Okay, yeah. So <coughs> if we, when we are depressed, we give something to someone, we do something for someone, that might help us to deal with the depression, but are we feeding the ego by that? Not necessarily. The, the word ego can have a negative connotation or it can just have a functional designation. Ego can refer to a arrogance or conceit or self-centeredness where I think I am so great and everybody else is useless. <coughs> But basically, ego can just refer also to a center of awareness. Sometimes in philosophical circles, there's a difference between ego and false ego. So false ego means imagining uh, that we are something which we are not. It's megalomania. I'm thinking I'm this big, big person. But ego means that I am, at a functional sense, we are a center of awareness. We are a conscious agent who chooses and acts. So we all need a sense of self-worth. We all need a sense that we can make a difference. We can make a di Without that basic sense of self-worth, we will not be able to function at all. We are each one of us very tiny, we are infinitesimal. But although we are infinitesimal, that doesn't mean that we count for nothing. Our actions, our choices, they count at least for our future and they count for the future of people around us. So it's when we see that we can make a difference, then that gives us a sense of, a sense of purpose a sense of energy and because we live in such a competitive society where we are often defined in terms of comparison with others so many people they often oscillate between uh, between grandiosity and depression Grandiosity. I am such a great person. I was reading a book about why there are mental health problems, especially among Ivy League students. In India, we can have IITs. I was just a few months ago in IIT, Kharagpur, and there one of the leading professors, he had come to meet me and said that we need some kind of counseling or some kind of, some kind of wisdom to encourage our students to seek alternatives to suicide when they have problems. So they found in IIT Mumbai that so many people, so many young people committed suicide that they became alarmed and the management decided to invest, do something about it. And they found all the students were committing suicide in one, one typical way. They would, they would have these electric fans, they would turn on the fan and they would have a rope hanging from it and they would put that rope around their neck and then they would turn on the fan button. So, when they started doing so, the management met 
and they decided on an emergency basis to replace all the fans with air conditioners. <laughs> now, now that can deal with the that can deal with that can deal with the specific way in which people are committing suicide, but that is not dealing with the mentality. The point which I am making here is so this book written by a social observer, he says he interviewed many Ivy League students. So they said that how one of the students he says that half of the time in my I would feel so great thinking of how I am better than everyone else. And half of the time, I would feel depressed thinking how everyone else is better than me. So basically, if we define our, because we are in a competitive world, naturally we will be compared with others. But that can be a social comparison. That doesn't have to be a self-defining comparison. It's failure in life is a practical problem. It is not an existential problem. Practical problem means, okay, I tried to do this, this didn't work. Now should I do this again or should I do something? That's a practical issue. But when it becomes an existential problem, that means because of that failure, I start thinking that I am worth nothing. When failure, instead of seeing that as an event in our life, we let it become the defining event of our life. It may be failure in an exam, failure in a project, failure in a job, failure in a relationship. These can happen in our life and they will affect us, but they don't have to define us. So to deal with all these negativity that will come upon us, we need a sense of self-worth that is not dependent on these things. And, and having that sense of self-worth is actually essential for our psychological health. So, ego will come when we are too defined by our externals. So, if I can do something for someone, then I am a very good person. If I can't do anything for someone, what is the value of my life? Yes, it's not. it may be in a functional sense like that. But in an essential sense, I am an individual. I am a part of the divine. There is a spark of the divine within me. And I have value and significance to my existence independent of what contributions I am making right now. But if we make contributions, that helps us see that, take that conception simply from a thought to a reality. So if we, if we contribute and we focus so much on this makes me better than others then that's when it feeds the ego. But he said, this just helps me to understand that I too can contribute. Then that doesn't have to feed the ego. So it's how we perceive that it is. Whether it is, whether it is feeding our sense of self-worth, or whether it is nourishing our sense of self-worth, or whether it is inflating our sense of superiority over others. So only when it inflates our sense of superiority, that's when it feeds the ego. But when it just nourishes our sense of self-worth, then that is positive. Yeah, identifying our strengths and trying to give, you said like circle of strengths. Yes, right. Thank you. Okay. So yeah. Only when we could feel, only when we think that only I can do this, nobody else like that. That's like feeding the ego. Is it only when, when only I can do this, is that feeding the ego? Not necessarily, because at one level, all of us are unique. And we could say that we are all unique for a purpose. So what you can bring to the world, exactly that no one can bring. Each of us are meant to make a contribution in life. So it's not, so feeling that we are special or feeling that we are unique, that is also not necessarily feeding the ego. It becomes feeding the ego. It's different. There's a difference between thinking that I'm special or thinking I'm or I'm unique and thinking that I'm better than others. It's a subtle difference, but it's a significant difference. So it's just like an orchestra is there. Each person in the orchestra is contributing music in a distinct way. And if that person is not there, then the orchestra will not be that good. 
but that doesn't mean that that person alone is all that matters so we don't want to think that we are uh, we are uh, indispensable in the sense that that feeds our ego but if we see that there is a higher plan to life then we see that for each one of us there is a place and purpose in the world and it is not that we have to create that space for ourselves it is just that we have to find that space it's already there there is space for us there is an area in which we are meant to contribute and we just do we just be who we are meant to be so it's when we again it's whether we are centered on proving our superiority over others or we are centered we are driven simply by contributing what we are meant to contribute on doing justice to the gifts that we have been given <coughs> on helping others with whatever ta uh, whatever abilities we have so it's not that we don't consider others but when others become the basis of our self definition that means sometimes people feel good when they feel that they are better than others and people feel bad when they feel that they are lesser than others but and as i said at a functional level this comparison can't be avoided this we are in a competitive world but at a personal definitional level if you understand that yes this person is doing their role i am doing my role and let me just be the best that i can be so we see here that uh, whatever gifts we have been given we put it in this way that whatever we are is god's gift to us and whatever we become what we are is god's gift to us what we become is our gift to god so what we are is is actually a gift we all have certain gifts some talents and we see that that the divine has given those to us and then using these what we become is what we bring to the world is our, the gift that we offer to the world now somebody else may be also offering something similar somebody else may be offering something better somebody else may be offering something lesser that's okay that's between them and the divine it's for us to be the best that we can be so if we see this as our possessions which make us proud then that that can be negative so even our sense of speciality or our sense of uniqueness if we see that as with a mentality of entitlement this is what i am then that can make us proud but if we see that as a gift which we are meant to utilize and contribute then acknowledging our specialness doesn't necessarily have to lead to pride it can actually just lead to a greater sense of purpose okay thank you yes one last question oh, i take one question should we stop okay okay last question please so prabhu uh, thank you you're talking about uh, like people get depression thinking i'm useless and this for nothing or like world is still goes on without me and things like that and people might have that thoughts so uh, it, some of the that might be the cause some people go and commit suicide i'm thinking and what would be a person like who's observing outside that some person have those kind of thoughts and how should they deal with it and like how to tell them that they work and things like that is there any okay if somebody is becoming depressed or suicidal because they feel that they are they're dispensable they don't count at all and how can somebody who is outside somebody is observing them help them yes i think just being available for people to if people can feel if somebody can feel that we can non judgmentally understand them then people ready, people are ready to open up actually the biggest burden is the burden of a mask sometimes you think if i am carrying a heavy bag that will burden me yes it can but a mask wherein out of fear of judgment by others we have to conceal and deny 
what we are, our struggles, our fears, our, our problems. And then that keeps becoming worse and worse and worse. So the mask, which is born out of fear, of course, to some extent, we all have lower desires and we discipline them, which is what is required in civilized society. But if certain issues are troubling us and we have nowhere to share that, then that becomes a burden. So, if somehow we can give people the faith that, that, that we are not going to judge them, then they can open. And once they open, then we can, we can direct their thoughts in a particular way, we can suggest certain things. But as long as people live in denial, everything is fine. Everything is fine. Now sometimes people listen, people are not saying they are fine. They say I'm depressed and they are they make a big show of that I'm depressed. But now even then, actually there they are in denial of the possibility that they can come out of depression. That means they just accepted that this is how I am. And they think if I try to give if I try to change and if I'm not able to change, then people will judge me, people will condemn me. So just let me stop trying itself. Basically, it's the people need a sense of connection with others. So, if some there are some areas in which people feel safe to open up, say if we are alone in our house and we say we are we happen to be living in a locality where there's a lot of crime, if somebody knocks on the door, we won't immediately open the door. Now that we will see maybe through our peephole or the security window who is there, or we might just open the door slightly, keep a chain over there and then talk who is there. So like that, often people through their words, they open their heart a little bit. So if we can, if at that time, we act in a non-judgmental, helpful way, then they will open their hearts further. And especially, if we can connect them with some spiritual wisdom, some spiritual practice, during that, that connection that we have established, then even if we are not there, that spirituality will be there with them. So that means we try to establish a personal connection with them first and then we try to give a spiritual connection to them. So it's a how specifically to do it. If somebody is very seriously depressed, then it's best that they may need to seek some help from somebody who is trained. And they're not ready to take that help, then we can be, try to become the medium in between. But we cannot ourselves become too caught in somebody else's world. When we are trying to help others, we can't help people unless they want to be helped. The door to personal change is, uh, can be opened only from inside. So unless they have at least some spark of change is there, otherwise we'll be beating our head. And unfortunately, it will hurt us only. So we want to help others. It's like, I'll conclude with this example that hey, sometimes a person is driving a car. And they get into the car, but the car doesn't start. I think it happens more in India than here. And if the car is not starting, then the driver asks for help. And then we have a dozen people come and they start pushing the car from behind. And they push the car from inside, the person from, push the car from outside, the person from inside is also steering the car turning it on and then together they get the car too. Now suppose this people from outside pushing the car and the person from inside is pressing the brake. <laughs> <laughs> then people outside say, why should I keep pushing? <laughs> or if the person from inside has gone to sleep on the wheels. <laughs> so then pushing will be a waste of time. So like that, sometimes just People are just not in the position to be helped. And in trying to help them, we may get agitated and we may get depressed. So we have to be careful that we protect our own health. We don't get too emotionally entangled in other people's issues. And then when they are ready to be helped, we are there to help. Okay. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.